Dr. Andrew Michter is Director of the Snowcroft Strategy Initiative and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council of the United States in Washington, D.C. Previously, he was Dean of the College of International and Security Studies at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in garmisch partenkirchen Germany. In 2015-16, he was Professor of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval College. Prior to that, he filled many similarly prestigious roles. He is also a member of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London and has published numerous books and articles on European security, U.S. security, NATO and transatlantic relations. Andrew, it's a huge pleasure and honor to welcome you to the channel. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Well, we're going to dive into some uh, topics that, that that may be a little tricky. I'm going to jump in straight away by, by asking a fairly challenging question. And this comes back to something I think we're going to talk about a lot here, which is the self-deterrence of the West. And I have to ask, what is NATO for? And has Article 5 lost the power of deterrence? Because we do seem to be self-deterring at every step over the last two years, whenever Russia says, boo, we seem to jump. Well, I would separate these two things, uh, Jonathan. First, um, I would argue that NATO has successfully deterred uh, any sort of direct Russian threat uh, to its territory. And uh, especially if you look at the fact how important the uh, J-Town or Yashonka Zeshuf uh, logistical supply hub is on Polish territory to supplying Ukraine, uh, logically, if the Russians were not concerned about a response from the alliance, they would have tried to target that directly. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, uh, so that kind of changes it. But your point is valid. Um, I would argue that since the beginning of this conflict, we have been very reluctant uh, to actually commit the kind of resources that Ukraine needs to deal a strategic level defeat to the Russians on its territory. And uh, I, for one, am, am really concerned that had we given the Ukrainians uh, for their first offensive, when that army was really the, the best trained at that point, we've worked with the Ukrainians since 2015. It had the highest morale, was the best trained, was really flying high. Had we given them the kind of resources we gave them even for the second offensive, even without the air power and the rest of it, I think they had a good chance of breaking the Russians because the Russians had no logistics at that time. They were extremely poorly led. And most of all, they had no defenses. So um, I think the problem is largely political. Of course, there's a, a there's a kind of industrial military dimension to this. Um, the West has disarmed to, to a point, especially the European allies, um, that we find it very difficult to actually find the stocks of munitions and weapons to provide. Um, but uh, but the but that aside, the problem I think is um, not having the strategic courage and vision to actually uh, move in the direction of reshaping the the entire region. And here's the point uh, I, I want to make. I've advocated for the membership uh, of Ukraine's membership in NATO from day one, uh, not because I have this or that particular affinity or or whatever. It's really the only and the most cost-effective pathway forward, uh, not just to stabilize and secure Ukraine, but actually to stabilize Europe and, and, and to, to uh, secure Europe. Um, and unfortunately, if you looked at what happened at Vilnius, uh, we lack the, we lack the uh, kind of courage and vision to take that step. And instead, the message that we're sending, you know, Russia cannot win, uh, Ukraine cannot lose, uh, I keep scratching my head, you know, thinking, what does this really mean in strategic and operational terms? So we need a vision of victory. In the Cold War, we seem to have more will to project our values and to reinforce Western security. And I was talking, I was in Berlin recently, and that really brought home this idea that we were prepared to do an awful lot to prevent the Soviets from taking over the Western sector of Berlin um, and to prevent further encroachment into Western Europe. Is that the kind of imagination and will and marshalling of resources that we need at this time? And why is that imagination lacking? I would say there are two reasons for that. Um, one is, um, 
in a, and paradoxically, it's it's both a function of the Russian threat and the Russian weakness, relative Russian weakness, if you will, compared to where the Soviet Union was. Uh, during the Cold War, you had the, the Soviet military sitting inside Germany. They had 54 non-Soviet Warsaw Pact divisions at a snap of a finger. Uh, the kind of nuclear and conventional threats that they posed uh, made it absolutely impossible to think in any other way, but yes, we're all in the same boat. If, if this happens, whether you're in the UK or, or in Germany or in Denmark or even neutral Sweden or whatever, this is going to ruin your day, uh, to, to, be, to be jokingly uh, saying that. What has happened now is because the Russian Federation with all its, uh, all its kind of revisionist uh, and neo-imperialist uh, proclivities. Russia is relitigating the end of the Cold War right now, trying to rebuild the sphere of influence, re-enter European politics. It's only a country of 140 million people. It's GDP in absolute and relative terms compared to where Europe is. Uh, tells you everything you need to know in terms of uh, how, how deep their, their economic strength really is. Um, and what, what also changed is that you know, during the Cold War, Germany was a frontier state. Uh, today, Poland is in that position. Poland is the hub of the entire confrontation. The Germans are no longer exposed on the border. They have buffer states. Um, and so while NATO is unified in terms of the kind of overall political approach to the crisis, no, Russia cannot be allowed to continue doing this, it is, it is really divided when it comes to the appetite for risk taking. And I call it the, the kind of regionalization of security optics. So I was recently in Finland, uh, in Warsaw, you know, when I go to Tallinn or, or, or Bucharest, they get it. It's all about Russia. And, and they understand the intensity of the threat, and especially the Baltic states. Uh, uh, you know, for them, it's an existential threat. If they, if they are to be overrun and occupied, they, they will lose everything. Uh, when I'm in Berlin, the conversation is different. There's less, less of an intensity. Uh, the Germans tried for two decades to manage the Russian relationship to political and economic means while they literally defunded the Bundeswehr to a point that it's just a pale shadow of what it used to be. It'll take the Germans, in my assessment, about a decade to rebuild. The French still continue to look to the South very much. You know, the conversation I recently uh, had is, uh, you know, uh, Europe's southern border is not really on the Med. It's in Africa. It's deep on the Sahel. Uh, you know, so so and and I joke sometimes that when I get to Portugal, I have no idea what they're talking about other than migration. So my point is that inability to lean in the way you had this during the Cold War is largely driven by a kind of fragmented security optics. And the last point I would make, you know, the architecture of post-war Europe. Uh, and this kind of tremendously visionary and, and, and forward-leaning uh, approach that gave us the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that created American security umbrella that made the U.S. stay in and then underneath that umbrella, the you know, European coal and steel community, the rest of the European project, Franco-German reconciliation, that was truly revolutionary and groundbreaking at the time. We've lived with this for 75 years, so... We're kind of, you know, on NATO's side, we're assuming this is status quo. It was very, very fresh and very different. Europe has rolled, I don't want to say this flippantly, but really has lived very well, has rolled in butter for the last 30 years. Good times tend to produce managers. They, they, they don't produce leaders, right? Uh, and this is not to disparage anybody. This is just to say that our political processes um, are what they are. And so until this kind of, I wrote a piece some time ago for the Wall Street Journal, I called it, when it comes to China and Russia, there was a crisis of disbelief among a number of European elite leaders uh, that the good times are over, that this is a system transforming war. So you add, you add these different elements to it. And I think that explains to, to, to a large extent uh, why without American leadership, Europe continues to struggle. And quite frankly, without American logistics, none of the assistance that was given to Ukraine would have been possible. That's an incredibly important point, but I'd like to, to bring you up on, on one of the things you mentioned there. And I think you referred to it as sort of the self-deterrence that seems to be underpinning uh, at least some of the thought in the West. And all this, also this phrase of managers in charge, because it does seem that this idea of self-deterrence 
is a policy governed by fear. It's based on some kind of false realism or a sense of status quo that no longer exists. Even a sense of Russia as being less malignant than it actually now is. So it's a misrepresentation of that. And the idea that you can manage the risk in this situation, you can kind of put a lid on it uh, and control that risk. Um, that seems to me a, a strategy built on blind faith, not facts, um, and on numerous assumptions, which people like yourself, Keir Giles and others uh, continuously point out are, are just that, assumptions and not reality. I agree. Look, um, I remember a couple of years ago when I was at the Munich Security Conference, uh, that was the time when uh, everybody was predicting, you know, you know, immediate victory in Ukraine. Russia was the second best army in Ukraine. And, you know, uh, very, very different from the last security conference where it was, oh, my God, doom and gloom, everything's collapsing. Somewhere between those two extremes, by the way, there's probably the reality uh, of where this war finds itself today. But I wrote a tweet that was picked up at, by Politico at that time. I said, you know, this felt like 1938 to me. Um, you know, we were here in Bayerischer Hof. We were drinking, you know, nice lattes, having good food, talking about how complicated the world is. And there is a firestorm ranging only a few hundred kilometers, you know, uh, away from, from, uh, from that place. And if you think about it, and again, you can over-rationalize history and push things a little too far, but, but indulge me for a second. But th there are two things that I find striking. One is, uh, like before the Second World War, we had two major powers arming at speed and scale. And that was Germany and Japan at that time. Uh, and they were arming not in order to deter or defend, but in order to attack. Uh, right now, you've got China and Russia operating on the same premise, same assumption. Um, the Chinese are trying to establish regional hegemony in the Indo-Pacific and then project from there that the Russians are trying to re-enter European politics with their own sphere of influence. And actually, it's worse this, this time around because you also have Iran and North Korea. So, so, so you have an, an axis of dictatorships, as I like to, to call it. Um, the second thing is Europe back then was also still kind of quasi-delusional about finding a, a diplomatic solution. And the United States was not ready for war before the Second World War, and it was uh, was it you know still turning inward. And we have some of these elements, but for different reasons today. <clears throat> so the reason I think we are in this situation uh, is several fold. First of all, remember that the U.S. is coming out of two decades of the so-called global war on terror. What that what that did? First of all, the nation is fatigued; people are tired. Uh, we've, uh, I once used an expression in, in one of my uh, lectures that we fought scheduled wars for the last 20 years. Uh, and those wars reformatted both our joint force for those overseas, you know, out of area operations. The same, by the way, for most of the European uh, militaries. What it also did is it contracted our defense industrial base, both in the US and, and in Europe, because the mon mantra of those wars was just in time deliveries, you know, efficiency, because we could calculate the ordinance we needed, we control every domain, logistics were not threatened and the rest of it. All of a sudden, we're looking at the battlefield, battlefield of Ukraine and we're going, oh my God, all of our assumptions about stockpiles, uh, precision, everything has to be revised. All of a sudden, we need to move in our mindset from this just in time to just in case, our logistics will be threatened in, in an all out conflict. And we need to re reformat our militaries back to state on state uh, war, uh, where certain verities hold. I mean, Ukraine is a strange mix of 21st century and 20th century kind of battlefield. And what our planners are learning is that, you know, maneuver and attrition are a continuum. They're not they're not discreet and, and, and whatnot. So the fact that we are entering this crisis because we woke up too late, in my view, uh, there was ample evidence, uh, basically since the arrival of Putin, but at least from 2005 when he speaks to his, to his uh, legislature and then when he's at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, it's a de facto declaration of war on the West. Uh, you know, we're now in a kinetic phase in Ukraine, but we've had several kinetic episodes. Uh, and every single time he used military power, he scored a geopolitical win uh, 
with very low cost. So he invades Georgia, right? What's the reaction? Slap on the wrist. Nord Stream 1 is completed. He invades Crimea in 2014. Another slap on the wrist. Nord Stream 2 is not just completed, it started. He butchers Syrians at Aleppo. He's a big player in the Middle East now. Then he watches us pull out of Afghanistan and he assumes he's going to you know, roll into, into Ukraine. And incidentally, before he invades, the Biden administration lifts the sanctions on Nord Stream 2. So actually, historians will marvel why he did that, because he would have had Germany about 60% dependent on Russian gas by that time, you know, and Germany would have been the biggest distributor uh, of that. And what he was pitching, I think, to the Europeans was, was you know, a spheres of influence kind of a deal. Um, so we we were caught unawares because we didn't recognize the indications of what was coming. And right now, it's very hard to start speaking in, in very direct terms about the situation. Look at our national security documents, right? We're talking about strategic competition, great power competition. We're talking about defending the rules-based international order. In the national security strategy of the United States, China is identified as a pacing threat, but Russia is identified as an acute threat. Well, I disagree with the latter. Russia is not an acute threat. Russia is a chronic threat. Regardless of what happens on the battlefields in Ukraine, if Russia finds itself even pushed out of Ukraine, who on earth believes that all of a sudden it will decide, okay, now we're going to try to figure out how to be a a, you know, a, a democratic cooperative entity. No, it'll it'll rearm and and it will go for another round. And the same thing should should there be a ceasefire. The Russians will use that uh, time frame to reconstitute as long as this imperial drive remains in place until it is broken. And and if it's if they're not defeated in Ukraine, it will not be. Uh, they will feel empowered and and strengthened, and they will go for another round and another round. So. <clears throat> to a large extent, I apologize for such a long intervention, but to a large extent, I think, um, it's the unwillingness on our part to address directly the world as it is. And so instead of saying that, yes, we're in effect now in a, in, in, in a, under threat of a larger war as the theater expands, you know, it's Eastern Europe, now it's the the Middle East, it may migrate to the North Korean Peninsula if you look at how the North Koreans are behaving. And obviously the Indo-Pacific, we are using terms that are more metaphors than the actual descriptors. I want our strategy to be focusing on not so much what we're defending. I want, want us to stop being reactive. I want to hear like in 1945-49 in that time frame. What is the world we want to shape that favors our interests and our priorities, that supports democracy and supports market economies, and be proactive in actually making the other side kind of end up on its heels? Uh, and unfortunately, we're not there yet. And this prompts two questions. They, they might seem like very different questions, but I think they come back to the idea that we haven't faced reality. One is that the Ukraine war obviously has an extraordinary mix of 21st century technology, but a absolutely massive at scale requirement for 20th century technology. Um, howitzers, uh, vast amounts of shells, which have turned the landscape into a kind of World War I battlefield, the enormous use of, of landmines and so on. That is perhaps a mechanized or armored war at scale that we're not yet geared up for. And I'd be interested to hear your view on that. The second one is, are we still trapped in this mindset that negotiation is possible? Is our strategy born again out of a disconnect with reality that by managing the situation and the attritional warfare, that this can still end up with some kind of negotiated solution with Russia? I doubt whether you or Keir would, would buy into that, but it does seem that our uh, strategies still seem predicated on that being a possibility. I think there are two things, especially in the United States on this. So uh, ever since 2012, when President Obama spoke about the pivot to Asia, and also, you know, we had this reset with Russia at that time, both policies, in my view, were, were very unsuccessful. Uh, and the consequences of those kind of remain with us because <clears throat> pivot to Asia rests on the idea, and, and it's created almost a school right now. It's been over a decade now, and there are enough people inside the Beltway who now talk in those terms. 
uh, it gives you an impression that through a strategic sleight of hand, you can address the inadequacy of our resources. In other words, um, I said this once to a colleague who's promoting this, uh, this idea of pivoting away from Europe and pivoting to Asia, focusing on China. And don't get me wrong, China is the most urgent threat that the United States faces because of the industrial capacity, population resources, and the kind of dependencies that the Chinese have been able to create effectively over, over the, the last mad, crazy years, the three decades of so-called globalization, uh, you know, and all the fancy theories around that that made the, that that actually weakened the West uh, and the United States overall and created this incredibly uh, dangerous now uh, state with the industrial base that we effectively built and technologies that we effectively transferred and, and educational and other issues that we have provided. So um, if you look at the at the US defense spending this year, for example, uh, we're at about 3.1%, right? If you look at the inflation rate when it comes to acquisition of weapon systems, it's probably somewhere around 2.7, 2.8 in real time, top terms. Our, our, our joint forces is authorized at the nominal 1.3 million. Um, now, remember that during the Cold War, we spent on average about 6%. 67 at the height of the Vietnam War, we're close to 10% of GDP. If you look at the size of the joint force, we were never below 2 million. And actually, Vietnam era, again, using the 67 example, we were at about 3.5 million. <clears throat> and we had one major theater at that time when it comes to a near-peer competitor, right? Right now, we have two. We have the Atlantic and the Pacific. So uh, what I hear in these debates is rather than saying, you know what, we're not, if we want, if we want to protect our interests, and I believe that the Atlantic and the Pacific are not an either or proposition, they're together with, uh, they're both critical to US security at, at home, to our prosperity, access to resources, foreign trade, and the rest of it. So um, if indeed that's the first statement, right, that, that we may agree on, and, and then, okay, what are the resources that I need to keep it? What is the force posture? What is the alliance structure? That should be the conversation. Instead, unfortunately, we got caught in this, well, let's, let's pivot and refocus, and the Europeans are fat enough, because admittedly, you're fat. You're not strong. You're fat. <laughs> I don't mean to be offensive, but Europe is very affluent, and its population resources just lacks the capabilities to do much of anything. Um, but that, to me, is like, you know, I said to a friend, American national security is not a kiddie soccer game. You run from one end of the field to another. You, you, there's just no substitutes for rebuilding. You know, we only have now five major defense and space contractor. Well, con contractors, they will rebuild if the government issues contracts. Um, so that's the first thing. And the same thing goes for Europe. There are no shortcuts here. The second thing is about your question about mass. Uh, look, I remember when the war started, the Ukrainians were shooting about 5,155 millimeter shells. The Russians could go up, you know, to even 25,000, even more, sometimes even 50,000. We were producing at that time 15,155 millimeter shells per month. So the Ukrainians were shooting in three days what we were producing in a month. We've increased this eightfold, but, but that I'm just using this in an anecdotal fashion to give you a sense of scale, okay? Um, we, for 20 years, basically fought, if you think of Afghanistan, for example, we fought on an 18th century battlefield with 21st century weapons. We're dropping ordnance worth millions on, you know, fighters with a plywood Kalashnikov and, and, and sandals. I mean, I'm overdrawing it, but, but my point is we've expended extremely expensive ordnance and systems. And all of a sudden we're discovering that actually it's not just all about precision, that building weapons that are ever more sophisticated and all the rate, we're now, we're now about to, uh, to design and build the sixth generation aircraft, right? We're, we're working on unmanned systems and all of that. Whereas the reality is that somewhere between the mass the Russians are putting into, into play and the precision, there's a simple equation. If, if the adversary brings a number of tanks and you may have the most exquisite anti-tank weapons, but in limited numbers, and he starts driving and doesn't care about the life of his crews, every tank takes a javelin or a round or whatever. And if you run out, they'll keep driving. So I think the first, I wrote a piece for this on this for the Atlantic Council 
mass matters. If the adversary brings a brigade, you need to be able to bring a brigade. Uh, you're, you're, you're talking to me from London. Look at the size of the British Army today. And it's still going to shrink. I'm just thinking, if this is the answer, what's the question? How long will it take the UK to put one division into, into the mix? You know, and, uh, and we have regional plans for NATO that require specific capabilities. And those plans are political commitments. So um, we are in a situation where we're, we're kind of trying to learn very quickly. And I hope we're running on time and that we'll make it because the defense industrial capacity has been so constrained now that yes, the Finns bought over 60 F-35s. When will they actually receive them? The Poles bought over 30 some F-35s. They're buying 250 Sep V-3 uh, Abrams tanks in Poland. Well, when will those come in? The industrial capacity is what we have to focus on and there are no shortcuts. What I find very distressing though, uh, I was just watching recently a debate in the EU. So the EU now is talking about creating its own army and you know having a commissioner for, for defense. Stop multiplying institutions, I tell my European friends. Just do your job within NATO, provide the capabilities. Uh, we need to get to a point where the size of the US joint force and the constraints we have, and we have a 34 trillion national debt right now, remember. So with that, there's absolutely no reason why Europe should not provide the core of the conventional deterrent and defense capabilities. The US provides the nuclear umbrella. Of course, our conventional portion that's proportionate, high in enablers, but, but the burden of conventional deterrence and defense uh, within NATO, I emphasize, don't, don't build new structures within NATO, should come from Europe. And is one of the challenges to scale up that there's no as you mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation, there's no clear vision of, of, of where this is going to lead. There's even no clear vision yet of whether Ukraine will be in or out or how you handle uh, you know, occupied territories versus unoccupied. Um, and of course, Ukraine has extraordinary military experience and the largest army at Europe at this point, and certainly the most practiced um, with an incredible number of people who are well-versed in, or pioneers even, in sort of drone warfare and so on. How important is it for us to define where we want to end up in terms of Europe's borders, in terms of, you know, democracies, uh, and even, uh, let's say, sort of NATO territories? This is absolutely the fundamental question. You know, as the cliche says, uh, goes, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Uh, that is what I've been objecting to, is that we're reactive, we're status quo. Um, and, and it's not just, it's not just on, on military issues. If you look at our economic policy uh, across the West, I mean, if it's more of the same, uh, then it's over. You know, if we, if we continue uh, to rely on our critical supply chains, uh, on, on the adversary that we're supposed to confront, how is this supposed to work? Um, you know, we saw this during the pandemic, 80% of American antibiotics were coming out of China at that time. So, so there's some basic fundamentals of hard power that we have pretended for three decades, you know, did not exist, uh, right? The second thing is, what do we want the region to look like? And we're, we're talking about the end states in Ukraine. I always encourage people to talk about end states in Russia. Um, the, Russian, the Russian Federation is not a nation state, it's an empire, about 160 what the Russians called nationalities embedded in it. Um, I recently reviewed a manuscript uh, memoir by uh, Lev Dobryansky, the uh, author of the uh, Captive Nations Resolution from 1959, who passed away not so long ago. And he actually talked about the Russian Federation shortly before his death in very similar terms as he talked about Eastern Europe under communism. Uh, Europe has a Russia problem. The West has a Russia problem. Um, again, I use some historical parallels in, in the past, but if you remember uh, the, the, uh, what happened in Europe, especially in, during the Weimar Germany period, right? Where you had um, essentially a narrative that German, the Reichswehr was not defeated, it was stabbed in the back, the Deutschloss Legende, as the Germans call it, um, it, that it was betrayed by cowardly politicians, and that gave them Hitler, gave them another drive for empire. Um, I actually look at the 20 years between the First and the Second World War as more of an armistice between the two battles. 
uh, until finally the combined resources of uh, the West, the United States, the Soviet Union broke that imperial drive and, and Germany had to figure out how to become a quote unquote normal state. If you look at, at Yeltsin's Russia, that's the Russian Weimar. That's the narrative of you know the drunken man who cannot control anything, everything's imploding. Putin comes to power after that decade. And I watch a lot of Russian television, by the way, which is damaging to my health, but, but it's my profession. He's not fighting Ukraine. He's fighting the West. He's restoring the glory, the Pax Russica, the great Russian, Ruski Mir, as he, as he calls it. And so his narrative is very simple. We were betrayed. We were never defeated. The great Soviet Union uh, was betrayed by cowardly Gorbachev, drunken Yeltsin, the West, you know, the Moscovy duck. And he is going to bring this glory back. And, and I think his design is quite straightforward. Historically, the Russians have looked at the core of, the, of their empire as essentially the great Russians, uh, which was the, you know, the, the Russians proper, if you will, the Ukrainians, Malorusin, and the little Russians, as they would call them. And then the Belarusians, that's the Eastern Slavic core that he wants to rebuild. And uh, unfortunately, he has pretty much uh, embedded Belarus now in those structures. The Belarusian military is completely integrated now. So NATO has Russian forces on that border. So let, let's stop kidding ourselves. And if he gets Ukraine, he will park a wall of steel because then he will take Moldova as well as a rounding error. And it's, so not only the Black Sea that will be uh, shut down pretty much, but also the, um, the, the land forces that Romania will have to confront. And remember, Finland alone is 830 miles additional border that we have to defend. The Russians are restoring the Leningrad military district. Uh, they're talking about 1.5 million, possibly 1.7 million force that they want to generate. And they showed us that at least in this conflict, they can both fight and mobilize at the same time. Last comment on Ukraine. What concerns me is numbers, not just the numbers of munition, uh, munitions that we supply, but people. So when Ukraine became independent in 91, it was only, it was about 52 million, 51 and change. When the Russians invaded in 2022, it was just about 40 million. I would argue that today Ukraine is somewhere between 25 and 30 million people left in Ukraine. So that means that the Russians have about one in four population advantage. The average age of a Ukrainian soldier right now that goes into, in, in, into the, the battle is about 41 to 43. And most of all, because they, they, they have yet to address the general mobilization in a sense that would actually pull in the younger men. And I think the Ukrainian government, and rightly so, has been trying to protect those younger men. Somebody's going to be able to rebuild this country, you know, have families, make babies and the rest of it. Um, but what that means is that the troops on, on the front lines do not get relief. They, they essentially serve continuously for prolonged periods of time. And that is, in my view, very difficult to sustain for any military, Western, non-Western, Russian, uh, not Russian. The Russians are not very good. The Ukrainians are, are, are more motivated than they are. But remember that the Russians are sending, you know, people that they're not recruiting in their major cities. They're going into Buryatias and, and, and you know, different areas. Uh, and they're attriting the best that Ukraine has to put in the field with relatively poor quality. Their air force has improved as well. Uh, and you add to this the shortage of munitions that we have, and we have a very difficult situation. What am I driving in? In my view, there is no single country solution to the security dilemmas on the, on the flank uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, that's why so much is riding on the future of Ukraine. If Ukraine survives, uh, and I'm advocating for, for returning Ukraine to the territor territorial integrity, to the uh, borders that it, it rightfully has. And that includes Crimea, uh, in, in my mind. I think without Crimea, Ukraine will always struggle with, uh, with being able to uh, export grain, operate in the Black Sea, and the rest of it. And so if, 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 it, if it prevails, then the pull of a successful Ukraine on, on the region, and I'm thinking Belarus, uh, will be transformative. Because if you think about it, Jonathan, if you, if you remember those young men and women who went into the streets in, in Minsk to protest against the stolen election, they were beaten into a pulp, that's the emerging consolidating national identity of the kind we saw in Ukraine in the early 90s. Uh, 
And I think uh, the only way that that Europe will become stable again, if the region transforms itself as a whole, not just one country. And this is this is an interesting question, isn't it? Whether in a couple of years' time we could be talking about uh, Belarus as well as Ukraine being entirely within the uh, NATO EU uh, sort of security envelope, but that's that's far too far, I think, for many people to to think about at present. And that leads us to red lines, uh, okay. which seem to be spoken and unspoken, and there's been quite a bit of speculation about where they lie. But we also see Ukraine striking at Russian uh, fuel refineries, um, various grades of fuel that power Putin's war machine, as well as the civilian economy. Those are being attrited at an extraordinary rate. It's now estimated that year on year, the production of fuel oils has reduced by 14%, just dropped in the last couple of weeks. That is going to have a huge impact, and Russia has already put a block on export of fuel oils uh, in anticipation of that. Um, it's an extraordinary strategy by Ukraine, and it's also complemented by the insurgency in Belgorod and Kursk, and that is continuing. You know, In some ways, the um, terrorist attack in Moscow has deflected from that, maybe one could say ironically for the for the Kremlin regime, it's taken attention away from what's going on. Um, but this is an extraordinary strategy by Ukraine, one which could perhaps short circuit the war, could cause a collapse on the Russian side. And um, that means you don't have to have years of attritional warfare in the conventional sense on the battlefield. Um, I'd love to hear a comment on that, but also the speculation that pressure has been applied to Ukraine to stop doing it. And this has caused quite a storm because some people think this is potentially Russian disinformation fed through the Financial Times. It's not been widely covered, but that would, in my mind, fit this idea of escalation management. So it's it's kind of believable, uh, if, 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 if not slightly suspect, but one, one has to look at these sources and uh, perhaps raise them to see if there's any truth behind it. Yeah, you know, look, this is the key question. I've always uh, felt that uh, the way the Ukrainians were being constrained uh, by our own concerns about vertical escalation, and I think the principal driver of, of this self-deterrence on our part, if you will, is that uh, the Russians have talked the nuclear escalation game very effectively. Um, it's it's you know a question for debate whether they're doing this because we've signaled to them or we let them know or they've learned how concerned we are about vertical escalation. Um, I personally believe that first of all you can never rule it out. I mean it would be irresponsible to say that the risk is not there. Uh, but if you look at the consequences, should the Russians resort to uh, to a tactical nuclear strike in Ukraine? Uh, the consequences, I think, would be extremely serious for the Russians. Uh, first of all, the Chinese communicated in no uncertain terms that they do not want nuclear release in Eurasia. I don't think because they particularly care about Ukraine, but because of the impact on, on the nuclear threshold in the Indo-Pacific, and they, they, this would be a game changer. Uh, secondly, the Indians probably couldn't fence it uh, you know, on this issue, and, and the Indians are buying Russian oil at at a 20% premium over what uh, what Yellen said, uh, they would have to take a position. Most importantly, if Putin's uh, goal was to build a sphere of influence and a deal with the Europeans, I cannot imagine any government in Berlin or Paris, you know, entering into negotiations with a with a regime that just nuked, uh, you know, some target in in Europe. Um, and I will also quote a, a Ukrainian parliamentarian that I discussed this with uh, at one point when I was still working in Germany. And, and uh, the opinion was, look, I mean, what is he going to destroy with a small nuclear weapon that he's not destroying with conventional means? You know, kill a brigade or or, or he's destroying our cities and, and, and the rest of it. So the risk is there, but I think the risk is relatively low compared to the risk of horizontal escalation. You know, every time, whether accidentally or intentionally, a missile flies into a NATO territory, or um, you know the border violations with Russian helicopters or planes and, and the rest of it. There's always a risk of this triggering uh, uh, something much much, uh, much wider. Um, I think I think in the end um, it is about why we continue to assume that we can control escalation in this war. Uh, 
And, you know, it's like with any plans, the minute the first salvo goes off, things acquire their own momentum um, for both sides. So I actually have been quite critical of this policy for as long as it takes, because to me, this does not square with the fundamental principles of military art. Every nation has a breaking point. You don't want to be fighting to the last Ukrainian, as, as, a, as a colleague recently observed. I think the approach should be whatever it takes, give them what they need to achieve a strategic breakthrough, to make sure that this war is as brief as possible, causes as little damage as possible, both to the infrastructure and, and in, in terms of human losses, and put the Ukrainians in a position where if there is a negotiated settlement, they can negotiate from a position of strength and not from a position of weakness. And unfortunately, I think we, we are not there in terms of understanding what the, the, the consequences will be if we continue on the trajectory that we are. Um, last, last comment I would make here on, on, on this, um, you know, are we prepared to actually fully understand how system transforming this war has already been? Um, if we don't have the willingness to confront this, it will continue. I mean, the pressure will continue. The Chinese are watching what's happening in Ukraine. To them, it's about American staying power, about European staying power. If we don't have it, what it takes, you know, to see through having committed so much of our resources and prestige and credibility into this. If we lose credibility in the Atlantic, what makes us believe that we'll keep our credibility in the Indo-Pacific? Now, the answer is there's consensus within the political parties in the U.S. and the rest of it. That's all true. But, you know, in this brave new world of great power politics, we need to relearn the realities of hard power. And that means... You know, um, we need to communicate in no uncertain terms, not just through rhetoric, but through our force posture, our deployments. I've written um, uh, that we need, the reason we have legacy installations in Germany was because that was the point of contact during the Cold War. What we need today is we need permanent, uh, not rotational, but permanent U.S. basing and NATO basing, but especially I'm speaking from the U.S. side here, in uh, either Finland or one of the Baltic states, we need two brigade combat teams in Poland. And should uh, should Moldova fall, uh, also one brigade combat team in, in Romania. Uh, the only thing that really deters the Russians in the final analysis is, is American nuclear power and American conventional forces. And Europe needs to really start building its speed and scale. It starts talking about the R word, rearmament. There's no shortcut to that. It has population resources to do it. One final example before we sign off. So I was visiting Helsinki not so long ago. It's a small country, five and a half million people. Everybody serves from the age of 18 to 60. The level of trust in government institutions on the public side is off the charts. Um, if there is a, a crisis, they can go up to 280,000 of ready-made forces you know, uh, at a drop of a hat and mobilize up to 800,000 for complete civilian defense and population. This is five and a half million people. Look at other European countries, their resources, their GDP. Um, this should not even be a conversation. Europe should be able to provide within NATO what's needed to give SACURA the kind of operational capabilities that he needs. The very last question, I think it's going to be a short one, and it refers back to what you said at the start about the rise of nationalistic, fascistic regimes in the Second World War. You watch Russian propaganda. Unfortunately, I also uh, dive into that, and it's a, a putrid swamp of, of, of hatred um, and genocidal rhetoric. Are many of our politicians not sensing at this point the implications, the meaning of those words. Yet again, like in 2007 in Munich, we're hearing the words, but really not taking the meaning from them out of Putin's speeches and the speeches of his other mouthpieces in the Russian propagandistic networks. I think we've lived in the world for the last 30 years since this grand misdiagnosis, you know, the end of history 
uh, at the end of the Cold War. I mean, which always to me sounded quasi Bolshevik. You know, I thought it was only the Marxists who knew how history was going to end. But that aside, and 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 Frank Fukuyama is a, is a smart guy, so I, I don't want to redebate that. Um, but the realities why the Soviets imploded really had more to do with hard power and their inability to compete, especially as the digital revolution was taking place than anything else. Um, and so we have lived in this make-believe world. Uh, most of American universities today are largely irrelevant to this fight, which is kind of an interesting factor. Why? Because we no longer raise area studies experts. You know, being an area studies specialist is no longer a pathway to tenure. During the Cold War, it was very different. Universities produced people who spoke the languages of our adversary, who traveled, who understood the culture. So when somebody would say at the State Department, we're going to do this in Bulgaria, and then this would happen in Bulgaria, there was always somebody in that room who actually knew Bulgaria and would say, sir, very interesting, ain't going to happen because this is how things go in Bulgaria. I bring this anecdote up just to say the following. We live through what I call the triumph of the institutionalists for the last three decades. In other words, the, the kind of hubris and assumptions that institutions always trump culture that we can come in and nation build, state build. I mean, listen to the very terminology that we've lived in. We went into you know, sectarian Middle Eastern countries and we're going to build democracies there. And we completely misunderstood the fundamentals that cultures are very hard to change. And if you want to understand your adversary, you need to understand the adversary's culture. Brings me to the point of why we find it so difficult to understand this putrid Russian Im imperialism and nationalism and also why we find it so hard to understand that as China modernizes, it follows the path of every rising great power. It becomes geostrategically assertive, it becomes more nationalistic and politically committed to the system that made it possible. So all this, all this kind of nonsense about how Jeffersons would rise in China if the middle class were there, it, it was just, it, it, it was absurd. I actually think, not to sound too harsh, but to me, you know, globalization was fundamentally greed masquerading as an ideology. You know, it was to, to go for labor arbitrage when you had a semi-slave pool of labor in China, and then you had this huge energy pipe that the Russians connected to Europe. And, and this was about making 80% 80, 80 more on the dollar, and the rest of it was kind of fairy dust around it, how, how the world would change. So we're still living in this, what, what our leaders need to understand is that the Russian civilization is fundamentally different, that we should not mirror image and project, that the reason why we get everything wrong about Russia all the time, because we are, we're in our own bubble and we're working with bias confirmation because we're saying this is what we would do. This makes no sense. Why would you, like we said at the very beginning, why would you invade Ukraine when you had your deal on Nord Stream and everything else and, you know, you're deeply embedded in the European politics and on and on and on. We need to return ourselves to uh, at least some humility in acknowledging that what we represent in terms of uh, you know, democratic governments and, and the whole concept of the collective West, and I use collective West, including democracies in Asia and, and, and elsewhere, I don't, I don't think we're just limited but that cultures do matter and cultures are different and not everything is relative, that structural anthropology has really dry cleaned our brains to an extent that, that makes it difficult for us to recognize the binaries. You know, no, an army that rolls into Ukraine and rapes people and pillages and burns, you know, there is no other side in this. This is binary. There is such thing as bad men with bad intentions uh, and evil designs. And, you know, when Reagan talked about the evil empire, he was actually telling the truth in my view. So that's what we need to get back to, get some sanity about what we're confronting. Stop pretending that, you know, somehow we can negotiate ourselves out of this. Sometimes there comes a moment of a binary and you need to punch somebody in the nose to get that person to understand where the limits are. I think that's what we need to figure out in the West. Andrew, that's an incredibly strong place to end. A uh, very strong sentiment there, and I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for committing so much time to share your insights uh, with the audience today. I hope this gets a big audience, because I think what you've had to say is so uh, incredibly important. But thank you so much.
Thank you, Jonathan. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me.